Now this is a review I've done many times in class and students have found it useful. And it's looking at the relationship between concepts in healthcare and how we understand the nature of disease and how that relates to clinical features. So it's kind of an overall bit of a start really. So we start off with physiology. Now physiology is normal function and we could include anatomy there which of course is normal structure. So we have normal function and we have normal structure. The body needs to work normally using normal structures. And that's fine, that's good, that's what we want. But the trouble is sometimes there's changes and this, these changes can be what we call pathophysiological changes. So physiology can change to pathophysiology and pathophysiology is abnormal function. Now that's bad because we don't want the body to function abnormally. But it's good because it gives us an opportunity to work out what is going on. Because pathophysiology will give rise to clinical features. So how do we know there's been a disruption to normal physiology? Because the clinical features will tell us there's been pathophysiological change. So the pathophysiological change gives rise to the clinical features, but the clinical features inform us about the change. So as healthcare providers, we need to be able to recognize and interpret clinical features, deducing from that, that pathophysiological and indeed specific pathophysiological changes have taken place. But why does physiology change into pathophysiology in the first place? Well, the answer to this is etiology. And if you're watching in the US, you don't put an A in front of it. In the UK, we do. But etiology is that which causes. Etiology is the study of causality. And disease can be caused by factors which are genetic. It can be caused by factors which are environmental. And we do separate talks on these possibilities. But it can also be epigenetic. So there can be epigenetic factors that are etiological. Now epi actually means upon or lying upon or over or above. And, and these are epigenetic changes, are phenotypic traits. That is traits in the cell or in the individual caused by environmental factors. And these environmental factors are switching genes on and off. So it's not changing the genetics. The genetics is about the DNA, the genes that are actually present. The epigenetic factor or epigenetic factors can switch genes on and off affecting how cells, if you like, interpret or read their genotype. So there's a dynamic, um, dynamic interaction here between the environment and genetics, giving rise to these epigenetic changes. And they actually change the transcriptional potential of the genotype. In other words, deciding which gene should be read and which one shouldn't in effect. So for example, if fetuses uh, are malnourished, that can give rise to hypertension and metabolic syndrome in later life. So genetic environment, or epigenetic factors are etiological and they cause alterations to physiology to give rise to pathophysiological changes. Now, how do we know what clinical features have occurred? Well, there can be signs or there can be symptoms. Now, a sign is something physical that you see. So if you want to know if there's a sign, you would look or you would listen or you would feel or you would tap. These are the classic methods of investigation of clinical signs, observation, auscultation, palpation and percussion. So you might look 
and you might see cyanosis. You might listen and you might hear crepitation, you might hear crepitations in a lung or crepitus in a broken bone. You can feel and you might feel a tumour. You can tap and you might find dullness indicating lobe pneumonia or a full bladder or, or whatever it happens to be. And, and indeed to signs, we could, we, I think we can add smell to that. So you might smell the change associated with diabetic ketoacidosis. You might smell the characteristic odour from a wound indicating pseudomonas infection. So symptoms on the other hand are things that people tell you about. So a sign is something that we detect, a symptom is something that the patient informs us about. And sometimes we can use tools to help us with this. For example, we can ask patients about their level of pain on a score of 0 to 10. Or we can do a PQRST assessment of their pain, provoking, provoking factors, quality, region, timing of the pain, <coughs> and this sounds for something else I can't quite remember just now. But we can do a PQRST of, of pain. So the symptoms are what the patient will tell us about. And tied into that, also informing us about the clinical features, is the history. So we talk to the patient to get histories of the clinical features. So we can look at the history of the present complaint. And we can look at the general past history of our patient, giving us lots of information. So the way that the patient became ill, how they became aware that something felt wrong, all of this feeds into the clinical features and gives us huge amounts of diagnostic uh, information. And we can also carry out uh, observations. So clinical features can be informed by our observations. So you might think of doing the patient's temperature or their pulse, or their blood pressure, or their oxygen saturations, or whatever it is. Observations that we make, very often routine, but we know what the normal is, so we can recognize if there's variation from the normal. If there's variations from the normal, that will give us information about the clinical features, and from the clinical features, we can infer what pathophysiology is going on. So there can be observations. And also we can get information from investigations. We can investigate our patients. So we might order ultrasound to see what's going on or different forms of radiology. So we might do plain x-rays or we might do computerized tomography or we might do a magnetic, magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging, we might do MRI scanning or we might look in with our endoscopes. So we might do gastroscopy to look in the stomach or colonoscopy to look in the colon or cystoscopy to look in the bladder. Then of course we might do the classic tests like haematology. So haematological investigations might look at, um, for example, haemoglobin concentrations or platelet counts or the number of white blood cells to see if there's a leukocytosis. If there's an increase in lymphocytes, a lymphocytosis, and that might indicate viral infection or an increase in um, monocytes that might indicate tuberculosis or an increase in neutrophils, which might indicate... Uh, bacterial infection. So haematology can tell us all sorts of things, as can biochemistry. Very common investigation, what's the urea, what's the electrolytes, what's the sodium, what's the potassium, what's the patient's cholesterol, all these chemical things. And of course there's a microbiology as well, don't want to miss anyone out. So microbiology can give us culture and sensitivity tests, diagnosis of what bacteria are present and what antibiotics would be good. 
there can be viral studies. So all of this information is helping us to assess the plan, assess the patient. And once we've assessed, we can plan. And once we've planned, we can carry out interventions. And once we've carried out interventions, we can evaluate them. And when we evaluate them, that will feed back into another cycle of assessment. So the whole aim here really is that we can carry out uh, interventions to actually help our patients, positive interventions. We should be able to give rationales for these interventions based on research, based on evidence-based practice, such as uh, expert opinion and patient preferences. And as we intervene, we evaluate the effectiveness of those interventions and allows us to reassess and plan what to do next. So we have all these different concepts. We have this core idea that the, uh, the pathophysiology is altered physiology, altered anatomy, giving rise to clinical features. But we know that all of this is determined by our study of etiology, altering the physiology, giving rise to the pathophysiological features. We know that we need to assess patients by physical examination skills, signs, symptoms, and we need to be able to talk to our patients in clear, coherent manners, and we need to get historical information from our patients. So we need all the clinical assessment skills, we need all the communication skills to be able to get this information that we require so that we can assess our patients effectively. And then we've got all our uh, observation skills, taking clinical observations that are all going to feed into our understanding of the, our understanding of the um, clinical features. And then we've got all of the uh, investigations that we need to understand and support our patients through as they're investigated. Also, we can understand the clinical features better to infer what's going on in the pathophysiology. Also, we can assess our patients correctly. We need to be able to assess our patients so we can plan care, carry out the interventions that they need to help them evaluate these interventions and do this in a cyclical, thoughtful purposeful process as we evaluate what we've done use that to reassess the situation maybe then we could just discharge our patient that would be nice or it might lead to a further cycle of assessment planning implementation and evaluation so another area we need to look at so this kind of describes the disciplines that we all need to study to gain information and understanding about carrying out the correct interventions for the correct pathophysiological change. So hopefully we can correct the pathophysiological change and convert that back into normal physiology. So the patient no longer has pathophysiology, but we restore the patient to a physiological situation. We want them to be normal or as near normal as they possibly can be, given that there might be ongoing limitations from ongoing pathophysiology. So sometimes we have to manage our patients because we can't get rid of the pathophysiology. Other times, of course, we can cure them. Not as often as we would like, but we can restore normal anatomy and normal physiological function. So if you want to understand the nature of healthcare, this is some of the type of areas we'll have to look into. And what shows you understand healthcare is not so much that you can list the symptoms or list the signs or whatever it is. What shows that you understand 
is that you understand the relationship between these concepts. So why do these genetic, environmental and epigenetic factors cause etiological change? How does etiology alter physiology? How does physiology give rise to pathophysiology? So if you want to show you understand these things that we're talking about, these need to be arrows, what we're actually showing we understand is the arrows. So we could teach school children to list signs of clinical features or to list observations. But you as a professional, my question to you is, do you know what these arrows mean? Because it's these arrows that show your analytical, holistic understanding of the nature of your patient.